So thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this was uh, a very uh, important talk, and I know my office was in touch with, with quite a few people. Um, just make sure that we have all your contact information, because that's the way we can contact you. Uh, this is a UCLA PKD program that was started a couple of years ago, and I know a lot of you have been involved with that, so I thank you for that as well. And the, the, the key point from today's talk um, is uh, talking about kidneys, you know, how kidneys uh, are affected. Uh, even though it's called polycystic kidney disease, it's actually a systemic disease. There are other organs involved as well, not just kidneys, but the main focus is obviously the kidneys, and we'll be going over that. Renal is just another term for kidneys, and, and, and you, you'll be seeing that a lot, renal and kidneys, but that means the same thing, renal and kidneys. Now, uh, just, just before I get into the slide deck, just uh, to thank um, a lot of people, uh, uh, everybody in the room, obviously, UCLA for putting this together, but a lot of our donors and supporters. Um, uh, we need uh, support, and support will come in different ways to do these outreach programs, to do research, to do education. And a lot of you have, have supported us, and, and we have our deepest gratitude for all our donors and supporters in whatever format, you know, uh, you have supported us, so thank you very much. Uh, the study participants, um, I just want to take a couple of seconds. I'm a big researcher, we have a lot of clinical trials going on, and I know a lot of people in this room are on my studies. Um, and one thing I always tell to people who are doing studies, uh, why do they get involved in studies? Um, and I give three big reasons. One is, the hope is that, you know, it's a study, so we are looking for something that's better than what's currently available, right? And for, for PKD, it is, you know, we don't have anything available to treat the disease itself. So that's one. So hoping that we can slow down the progression, if not completely eliminate it. So that's the, that's the first. Second thing is, when you're enrolled in studies, the, the, the quality and the quantity of care you get cannot be replicated. You know, the, the amount of close follow-up that you get, the amount of people. Now, all of your information is de-identified. You know, only my office would know who the patients are, but the other ones will not know. So, but there are a lot of people looking at your labs, looking at your studies, um, looking at you know outcomes. So nothing would be missed. Your blood pressure checks, and and if you haven't gotten your blood pressure check, please please uh, make sure that you get it checked. There, there's two booths outside. So um, second, but the third and most important reason that that I say to be on studies is you're helping the future. You know. This is how we come up with new medications, and you'll be. And this is being a, a familial disease. You'll be having your family members down the line, but also the the impact that these studies have globally. How we can actually improve the care, and that's the only way to do that. So, so I do want to thank all my study participants. Uh, uh, we rely on them heavily. My UC and my research staff, as you can see, all of my uh, quite a bit of my my research office is over here, and I thank them. They're coming here on a weekend. And here, they're just to support the office. You know, they, they're not getting paid for this. It's a volunteer work that they're doing uh, on their own. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'll, I'll be going over. A um, couple of people that I don't want to buy. Christina, obviously, is my, my assistant and, and my partner in crime, like I say. Uh, but also, Sitare uh, actually helped develop the whole slide deck that I'll be presenting. So she spent a lot of time. So she actually also helped develop the slide deck that we had for the liver talk. And I forgot to give her credit for that. So I apologize, but she, she has worked you know, tirelessly over the last week to make sure that we can get the slide deck ready for you guys. The PKD Foundation, we have uh, Dwight, if you can stand up for a second. Uh, Dwight is, is our uh, uh, lo local chapter leader, but more than that, uh, a very good friend of mine and uh, a very big supporter. So please do, uh, uh, Dwight, um, his information I have. If you don't, uh, please join the PKD Foundation. The PKD Foundation is a big supporter of the UCLA PKD program and vice versa. So, so we thank that for that, Dwight. And there are a lot of other people from PKD Foundation over here as well. So um, with that, uh, just some questions. Uh, so we'll be going over some studies. There's a lot of excitement. We have two very exciting studies going on right now. Um, actually, one is just about to start. Uh, it's just an extension of an ongoing study, the tall Vapton studies. And then we have the CADMON study, which I think, and I'll be showing, showing some data about that at the end of my talk. Um, if you need appointments, and I know my clinics are in general closed, you know, uh, I don't have any open appointments, but if you want to see me, you just need to contact me directly. For PKD patients, we make special appointments. So my contact information is over there. 
uh, just email me and my office will help you schedule depending upon um, how urgent the appointment is. The other thing that, that I do want to mention is that the, um, the, the, this is a PKD program, it's a comprehensive program, so we have all subspecialties available. So if there's anything that you need, it's adults, pediatrics, geriatricians, and everything within that. So if there's anything we can help, even though it might not be directly uh, connected to PKD, uh, please, please let us know and we'll try to facilitate that as, as much as we can. And there was a lot of questions about donations. Uh, so just, and there's some information over there. Um, it is all tax deductible, you know. It, the donations are made to UCLA and then it helps the PKD uh, program. Um, and the check should be made, and the information is there. So I think there were some questions that were, I was being asked. But we have information if you're interested. And it's not just you. I mean, you can ask your contacts. You know, you can ask, you know, be a volunteer for our PKD program here and reach out to other people who might be interested, even though they don't have PKD and stuff. But all this, this goes towards programs like this and much more, and research. So we appreciate that very much. And this is our contact information, as you can see, it's directly my email, so every information goes to me. This is my office number, um, you can call us and leave a, leave a message. And just please make sure that you write your information um, in, in so that we can, we can um, contact you in the future. Uh, for, and when we send out these mass emails, it's all de-identified. Nobody knows that you're on the mailing list, so it's blind copied. So we make sure that, that the personal identification emails are not shared with anybody else. So, so please, please, uh, please do provide the contact information. And, and what Ishar had mentioned is the feedback. It's very important. So first of all, we want to know how you thought about the program, you know, the today's program uh, we put together, and if there's any way we can improve it. What other topics would you want to hear in the future? Um, uh, you know, hypertension, you want to, we did the polycystic liver disease, and this is something that I coordinate with, with, with uh, Dwight. Dwight has put on, you know, PKD Foundation puts on excellent uh, topics uh, all the time. So we work together on, on, on getting that done. So, so I'll, I'll work with Dwight on that. So feedback is very important. So please do fill out, you know, uh, at the end of the talk. Now, let's, let's, let's get into the meat of the uh, talk today. Um, the epidemiology, PKD, or specifically ADPKD, which stands for autosomal dominant, because there's an autosomal recessive form of, of PKD as well. But the topic today is ADPKD. It occurs worldwide and it affects all races. It affects both genders. Uh, so, so this is this is something that affects, uh, you know, doesn't have a, a bias or, or a selection bias towards one one group or the other. The prevalence, uh, at, as far as live births are concerned, one in four hundred to one in thousand um, people have the gene. Uh, and I'll be coming over how this gene actually manifests itself. So it's a pretty common. It's the most common inherited cause of kidney failure in the US. And about 10% of the population, after diabetes and hypertension, if you think about that, is the most common cause of patients ending up on, 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 on dialysis and needing transplant. So it is a significant burden on the society if you look at financially. And we want to do everything that we can to prevent that from happening, besides all the issues with, with patients, you know, the problems that they face. So it definitely should be in the forefront. And I know PKD Foundation is doing that to get more support uh, right, uh, Dwight, uh, from, from, from NIH and others, but also our group, we, we, we need to be more focused on how we can be more vocal, you know, uh, about the disease state. So uh, inheritance. So uh, the disease is what we, there are different um, uh, uh, ways a disease can be inherited. Uh, it is autosomal dominant, it's autosomal recessive, and it's, it's also X-linked uh, disease, which, which means that it is to the X chromosome. The, the inheritance for this disease is autosomal dominant. Um, and as you probably know, it comes in two formats, type one and type two. Type one is uh, the, the first gene is affected. It's the more common one. It's about 85%. The gene is on chromosome 16. And then the other one is uh, the type two, uh, which is on chromosome four. So as you can imagine, it's on different chromosomes. The type uh, one is by far the more common one. 85% uh, of patients have uh, type 1 PKD. But also it's a more aggressive one among the two. So patients manifest with, with, with uh, clinical uh, problems much more earlier than patients with uh, PKD uh, type 2. And this is how the blue one is the affected parent, the uh, white one is the unaffected. And as you can see, 
uh, there's about a one in two chance that, that uh, the offspring will, be, will inherit uh, the gene uh, uh, in this case. So that, I think that's, that's, that's about when you look. And that's why genetic counseling is very important. Uh, that is available at UCLA uh, if you need that, if you're planning to have, have babies or expanding your family and you want, we can get you in touch with, with genetic counseling. Um, I was told when I had, was giving a talk in Orange County and PKD that a lot of families who don't decide to have ba uh, extend their family. So I think that's the other extreme. But definitely, you know, it's good to be knowledgeable about what are the chances. Uh, and also the hope that, you know, we can, we can actually uh, treat the disease in the near future. Now, how is PKD caused? So these are the two genes. Uh, PKD1 gene is, is on, on, the, on the right hand side for you guys and the PKD2 gene is on the left hand side. And this is caused by mutations in these genes. Uh, and as, you know, just to give you an idea, this gene for PKD1 is very big. So it's a, it's a very big gene and it has a, it has a very big uh, receptor uh, that, that it forms on the membrane or receptor like actually. So there are a lot of mutations and some mutations are very specific to the families. Now when we are in doubt uh, of the diagnosis, we actually do the sequencing of these genes and look at what exactly is, is the location for the mutation. And sometimes it's very difficult because the mutation might be you know, uh, specific for that one family that's having it. So it's difficult to compare families with other families. So this is, this is the polycystin, that's the product of, of, the, of the PKD gene. Now, um, I mentioned PKD is a systemic disorder, so even though it's called polycystic kidney disease, it has a lot of other organs that might be affected. And I, I don't want to go over one by one. The, the first one that's, that's listed on the top is liver cysts. Now, liver cysts and, and liver disease um, is not common, but, but, but does happen and, and can be very significant in, in some patient population, especially females. So, so in, in that's something specifically that we look for. So when we do an ultrasound or imaging test, we, we don't just look at, at the kidneys, but we look at the liver, we look at every other organ that we can within your abdomen, but, but liver. And we have uh, designated hepatologists who are specialists in liver at UCLA who we refer to in case. And also if there's any surgical need um, for, for addressing these liver cysts, we can do that as well. Uh, they can also be pancreatic cysts. Um, those are important as well. Uh, most of them are benign, but some of them are not benign, and we need to look, look into those. Um, you can have diverticular outpouchings uh, in, in your uh, gut, and sometimes those can perforate and cause problems, so that's the other thing. Then the other one that's listed right at the top is called intracranial aneurysms. So these are weaknesses and dilatations in your blood vessels in the brain. And obviously, that's something that we take extremely seriously, uh, and we need to look at that. So, and then there could be some cardiac problems as well in the heart, um, and I'll come back to hypertension, uh, but there could be valve abnormalities. Uh, you can, your, your heart has valves that can be abnormal. So, so all those things need to be evaluated. So there has to be a more comprehensive approach um, to, to this. And then obviously, our big topic today is going to be the polycystic kidney disease, and we'll be talking about how the kidneys are affected. So that's the way your kidney should look like um, on the right hand side and on the left hand side is what it looks like when um, your kidneys actually have cysts. So, so these are all these cysts that grow and it goes with age. A question that I was being asked is when do these cysts start? These cysts start very early actually. They can start as, as early as in the fetus. You know, ARPKD which is more of the, the, the fetal and the infantile variant uh, but even uh, ADPKD can happen early on, but it manifests at different ages. You know, it can be 20, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. So just because you don't have cysts when you're 10 years old, that doesn't mean that you don't have PKD. Now, different uh, modalities have different sensitivities. So ultrasound um, is there, but then CT scans and MRIs uh, are much more sensitive. And people who are on the studies, uh, on my study, they, they know that they're getting MRIs as opposed to just getting ultrasounds and CT scans. And, and the reason for that is that MRIs are a bit more better in, in certain respects. You know, there's always variations, but MRIs are better. And we also look at kidney volume, though, not just the kidney size. So your kidney size should be about, depending on if you're an adult, 9 to 12 centimeters uh, in size. Um, but uh, in, in patients with PKD, they can go up to 18, 19, 20, 25 centimeters long. 
So if you can think about that, they, they can really expand. So it's both the cyst, the, the contour of the kidneys, and the size of the kidneys, both are important. So you can have a relatively normal sized kidneys, but still have multiple cysts, so that those are. And, and the reason why I'm kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of spending some time on this is because there's more and more evidence that kidney size is also a predictor, or the volume of the kidneys is a predictor of, of, of kidney outcomes. And a lot of time the blood tests stay normal um, till the very end, and, but the kidneys keep on, and then it kind of collapses. So, so, so when we do a full evaluation for, for kidney disease in PKD, it's not just the, uh, the blood test, we also look at the kidney size and, and the number of cysts that, that the patient has. So uh, on this cartoon on the uh, lower uh, left-hand side is a picture of a nephron. So nephron is the structural and functional unit of the kidney. Uh, and uh, each kidney is made up of a million of these nephrons. And there's specific sites within the nephron that have these cysts. And what's interesting is that only a small percent of the nephrons, say five to 10 percent, actually have cysts. Other ones don't. Um, and that's interesting because those five or 10 percent grow enough in size that it can actually affect the whole kidney function. And I'll be coming back to that uh, in a bit more, more detail as, as we speak. So what are some of the renal or kidney manifestations of PKD? One, and if you go one by one from the top, one is obviously enlargement. And the enlargement can, has its own, just, just occupying real estate in your abdomen, right? Uh, there's limited space, and when the kidneys are enlarged, and if your liver is enlarged as well, then you know, it kind of puts pressure on other organs. And some of the manifestations are because of that. You, know, you can have some gastrointestinal problems, uh, digestive problems, you know, uh, it can push up on your lungs and you can have breathing issues. So all these things are because of, of, the, of the, the size of the kidneys and the liver. Hypertension, I'll be coming back to that, it's a very important. So if you look at what things we can control now, you know, um, in today's day, you know, we're, we're doing studies, but there is no disease specific drug that is FD approved on the market yet for PKD. So all that we can do is supportive treatment. You know, and one of the biggest things is high blood pressure management. Um, and I think that's something that I'll be going in a bit more detail a bit later, but it's, it's very important. Hematuria is basically blood in your urine. Uh, you can have blood so much that your urine is red in color, or you can have what we call microscopic hematuria, meaning that uh, there's some blood cells, but not uh, enough to give a different color to your urine. So, so that's image that happens uh, with, with uh, and, and it could happen for a lot of reasons, and I'll be going over some of those. Function loss, that means the kidneys are not working properly, and sometimes it progresses enough that you will need actually replacement therapy. You might need dialysis, you might need transplant, but that kidneys are not enough to, to pump. Stones, kidney stones is another manifestation. So, so flank pain and back pain is, is, uh, is extremely common in advanced PKD. And, and you know, sometimes this flank pain or back pain could just be because of uh, uh, pressure issues. You know, it's in the flank and it's pushing up on all the organs. Or it, there could be something more significant. You can have a stone. You know, stones are common in PKD. Uh, there are different kinds of stones and uh, depends what kind of stone you have uh, will decide what treatment. There could be infection in these cysts. They could be bleeding within the cyst, like this. So these cysts actually uh, come from the collecting system, but actually might cut off. So, um, so stones are important, and, and I'll be going over that too in, in a bit more detail, you know, when you have infections, very important. So bladder infections, you know, uh, should be treated early, because most of the, so the way you can get kidney infections is two ways. You can get it from the top, meaning that it's coming from the blood, or you can get it from the bottom, that it's coming from your urethra, going to the bladder and ascending up to the kidneys. But infections, and you don't want that infection to go to the kidneys. Because once it infects the cysts, the cysts are, are a bit difficult to treat, if you can think about that, because they're walled off already, right? So bladder infections are important to treat early. And that's why, you know, when I, when I take this very seriously, there was a couple of patients who had bladder, and we, we get on top of that very quick, you know? Uh, and also you have to keep in mind, you know, if you have a lot of bladder infections, you might get resistant to drugs that are commonly used. So there are antibiotics that, that have better penetration to these cysts than other medications. So we, we do want to make sure that the bladder infections don't become kidney infections. I mean, I think that's, that's another 
and then flank pain uh, we spoke about. Uh, so going over one by one, uh, hypertension is, is a very common uh, manifestation of polycystic kidney disease, and that's something that, that you should take very seriously. And that's why there's a reason why we had two people checking your blood pressure outside. Um, because hypertension, um, and you know, there's a whole talk that I give on hypertension as well, but hypertension is, is easy to diagnose. It doesn't take too much. Uh, how many actually have a blood pressure instrument at home? Actually, let me put it the other way. How many don't have an instrument at home? Okay. So I think, I think that's very important to, to get it, you know, get it. But it has to be the right instrument, first of all. You know, the blood pressure has to be taken properly, and, and, um, and there is a proper way to take it. That's very important. And the way we were taking it outside is the right way, because you know, we are doing a very big hypertension study, uh, the SPRINT trial, and we actually look at blood pressure, you know, the way it's measured, the way it's, it's actually addressed. Um, I think it's, it's very important that we, we do it properly. That's number one. Number two is that if you do have a blood pressure instrument, like most of you do, take the blood pressure instrument to your physician and make sure that's calibrated, you know, because it might be different from what you're taking at home or the blood pressure instrument might be off. So make sure that, that it's lined up properly. The third thing is taking ownership of management. So what should be a blood pressure goal in general? Uh, and blood pressure does fluctuate uh, during the day. It might go up after certain things. It might go up after you have a cup of coffee, you know, caffeine drives it up, you know, if you're exercising, I mean, those are normal responses, but what is your overall blood pressure? And, and I think you should always keep a diary of your blood pressure and also medications you're taking for your blood pressure control. You know, you should always ask, and I'll be going over some medications that is actually recommended. So you want to be on medications that have benefit beyond just blood pressure control. They actually have benefits for your heart and for your kidneys as well. And there is, it is a class of drug. Uh, diet is very important. Salt intake, and people who come to my clinic, I always ask them about the salt intake. You know, and, and, and the short of the salt intake is that if you eat outside and if you eat uh, frozen food, if you eat, then you're not on a low salt diet. You know, uh, salt is a big driver of blood pressure. It's a big driver of outcome. So, you know, there's a lot of controversy what, what salt intake should be. My, my bottom line in salt intake is that you don't need any added salt, you know, in your diet. So I think that's, that's something that you can definitely uh, uh, help with in your blood pressure control. So renal enlargement, as we say, you know, the normal size kidney is in the middle. The, the cyst can become extremely massive, and depending upon the size, it can cause, cause uh, symptoms um, in, in both, both uh, locally uh, on other organs and also the kidneys themselves. You might feel a feeling of fullness uh, in, in your back. Now pain, uh, where this person's hands are, that's where kidneys are. Normally your kidneys are protected by your ribs. Uh, so so uh, they, they're below, uh, uh, just in the back over here. Um, so normally they're protected. Now the pain that you get, some of the reasons are listed over here. You can get uh, bleeding into your cyst. You can have an infection, you can have a stone. Tumor, rarely. I mean, we, a tumor is not a common cause of, of backache. But these are the, some of the common things that can cause acute uh, uh, pain in your flanks. And then there are the chronic flank pain that might just be fullness and pressures because of the kidney size and the distortion. So, so flank pain is, is common in patients with PKD, and these are some of the common causes um, that can cause this flank pain. Hypertension. Um, uh, just like I mentioned, I mean, this is a slide showing um, the, that the blood pressure control does. Uh, the, the class of drugs that we recommend uh, for blood pressure control in a patient uh, with PKD uh, belongs to uh, what we'll call the RAS blockers. These are ACE inhibitors, and I can, you know, if you want, just email us. I will send you what classes those are. Uh, but they're ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which, we, which stands for angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitor stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. So those are the, the two big classes that, that we strongly recommend every, unless there is a reason for you not to be on that. Um, and your goal, depending upon, you know, that's a whole topic, I won't get into it, but most of you are uh, within that age group that probably 120 over 80 is still your goal. You know, uh, the, the new guidelines just came out uh, from JNC 8, uh, Joint National Committee. It's a bit controversial, the guidelines, um, and there's some nuances that a lot of people don't understand uh, because they're making it more liberal that, you know, 140 is okay. But I think for, for, for PKD patients, you said, also you have to keep in mind blood pressure is important just in case you have a remote chance 
of some aneurysm in your brain, right? Um, you want the blood pressure to be on the lower side because the blood pressure, if you think about that, will cause more pressure on the aneurysm. So, so we do treat blood pressure very aggressively, and that's one thing that, that uh, is in our hands. Uh, uh, UTIs we spoke about, um, and these are all the stuff that, that I just mentioned, just being aggressive sometimes. Uh, there's, no, there's no symptoms uh, about uh, bladder infections. You know, a lot of times you think you might have urgency, you might have frequency, you might have burning, but a lot of times you don't have. It's, it's completely asymptomatic, and unless you do a urine test, you will not find out. Um, now, if you are having frequent bladder infections, then you definitely need to, to speak to a specialist, even maybe get involved with ID infectious diseases to prevent it and preventive measures so that you don't get frequent bladder infections. So bladder infections is also um, a very common thing that happens. This is the blood in the urine that I spoke about. Um, it could be visible, it depends upon how, how much blood you're peeing, or it could be microscopic. That means that you only find out when you test uh, the, the urine uh, for, 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 the, for the blood. Cyst hemorrhage, so these cysts, uh, even, Initially, they are, they are connected with the nephron, but eventually they, they cut off from the nephron and become independent. They're, they're by themselves. Now, when they're by themselves, you know, they become enclosed spaces, and it's like a closed room that uh, there's difficulty getting into. And, and you can have bleeding into these cysts. You can have infection in these cysts. These cysts can cause a lot of symptoms. If it's bleeding, it's, it's a very conservative management. You do blood, blood, uh, bed rest, you, you take some analgesics. Avoid uh, drugs like ibuprofen and Motrin. The only safe drug over the counter for kidneys uh, in the appropriate doses is Tylenol. That's the only drug uh, that you should be taking, uh, not, not anything. Can you say that name again? Uh, Tylenol. Tylenol. Tylenol, yeah. Unless you have liver problems. Unless you have a liver problem. But liver has a lot of capacity. Even patients with advanced, that's why I said appropriate. But even patients with advanced liver disease uh, can, can meta, as long as you keep it two grams or below, you know. Uh, I would prefer to keep it one gram, uh, but obviously talk to your physician before, before you take the medication. So uh, that's the issue with cysts. Now kidney stones, uh, once again just going over the, the different kinds of kidney stones, and they can occur into about 20% of the patients. So one in five patients with, with PKD, polycystic kidney disease, can have stones. So it's, it's not uh, a small number, and the different kinds of stones we have uric acid stones and calcium oxalate. Those are the, the common kind of stones. Uh, CT scan is probably the best way to diagnose these stones if you have them. Um, and uh, what, what, what we recommend if you have the stone, that we will, will send you to a urologist uh, so that you can have evaluation. But also we have to do a full workup for the stones. Now if you do have a stone, um, keep a strainer at home uh, because you want to collect that stone. That's very important. Uh, the evidence is in that piece of stone. And what we do is once we get the stone, we send it for a full biochemical evaluation. So we find out what kind of stone you're, you're, you're peeing out. And that will help us manage it better. And then finally, what we, we want to avoid is patients, if um, they have advanced liver disease, uh, or kidney disease, sorry, um, and it's progressing still, um, then getting to the right management. I think that's very important. So what we call um, renal replacement therapy. So if your kidney disease is advanced um, and you have done the best you can, uh, then you have to make sure that you know all the options you have. There are a lot of options for, for, for patients who are ending up on dialysis or transplant. There's living donors, and in living donors we have, we have the peer exchange program here at UCLA that you know if you can't donate, you have a person who, who wants to donate your kidney to you, but it's not a match, right? Uh, in the past, they couldn't donate, but now we have, we have, they have options uh, that, that, that they can work on. Uh, even on dialysis, there are, there are a lot of options, you know? Uh, not all is lost, so people think that now I'm on dialysis, but I have a lot of patients who are, uh, have PKD and are on dialysis and are doing fairly well, you know? Uh, but obviously our, our hope is that we would want to prevent this as much as we can, and that's the whole idea about doing these research that, 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 that we're doing. If you look at the plot, the green line is interesting, and on the, uh, on the, the vertical axis, you have the kidney function, 
and on the on the straight bottom you have age and the green line is actually indicating your kidney function as measured by GFR as measured by your blood test and as you can see it's straight straight to the end and then it, it drops off right and that's what I was mentioning to you that the kidney size keeps on growing right if you the kidney size is also listed below the kidneys keep on growing but if you don't do an imaging study you will never know that but your kidney function is normal by blood test and then there is a precipitous fall right after that and we really want to make sure that you don't get to that cliff uh, you know preventing you from getting a cliff for, for the best we can do uh, so uh, just want to make sure that that ESR is not inevitable in ARPKD, uh, ADPKD. Um, the, not everybody will, will end up, but there are some risk factors. Uh, and the, what are the risk factors for faster progression? Um, uh, gender is one. Males tend to progress uh, a bit more rapidly. Uh, patients who are hypertensive, patients who have early onset of disease, all those are, are risk factors. And then, you know, if you're using a lot of these medications like NLG6 and, and stuff that you should not be using, that will also make you uh, uh, move it towards uh, more rapidly. The other one is, um, like I mentioned, there were two types of PKDs, type one and type two. Type one tends to manifest earlier than type two. Type two has a bit of a later onset um, of patients requiring uh, dialysis or ESRD. So how do we diagnose uh, PKD? Uh, so, so the way to diagnose is through imaging studies. Uh, a, a simple ultrasound is good enough, uh, not expensive. Uh, not invasive, uh, there's no radiation, and we can go by the number of cysts they have. We also go by, by if there's a family history, the age, and all those things. Because you, you normally have cysts in your kidneys. The, the different reasons, uh, PKD is just one reason for having cysts. So as you age, you get more cysts in your kidneys. So we, we take that into account as well when we, we look at, at PKD. So it's, it's all these factors, not just a simple ultrasound. But, but if you need to make a diagnosis, that is probably the easiest way uh, to, to do it. And this is just the other testing, the, the MRIs and CT scans, more sensitive. Uh, they can pick up cysts that probably will not be picked up by uh, ultrasound, but CT scan has a lot of radiation and is expensive, and MRI is expensive. So, one of the uh, good things about the study that we're doing is you get MRIs for free. I mean, you don't have to go through your insurance. So, so that's the other, because, um, you know, in, in at least one study that we're doing, there is a placebo arm, and the question get asked, you know, do I, should I be on the placebo arm? And I said, absolutely, yes, you should be, because there are a lot of other benefits you get from being on a study. And then also, you, you have, a, have a fair chance on being on the study. You know, you'll never know, you know, if, if you're on placebo or not uh, till the end. Uh, testing, genetic testing. Uh, that is the gene sequencing uh, is not done routinely. Uh, we have used it um, when the diagnosis is not clear, especially if um, there is a chance that some of the family member wants to be a kidney donor. And we did an ultrasound and we didn't find this, we did a CT scan, but they still doubt. So we send them for, for genetic testing so we can look at, at the. Now, the problem with that is it's expensive. You know, it's, it's not a cheap test, but it will put, put, put at least, like I said, you know, if you remember the, the autosomal uh, dominant uh, uh, inheritance that I spoke about, they, there's one in two chances. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you're that other 50% that don't have the gene, right? So, so, so genetic testing does help, uh, but it's, it's not used frequently and definitely not used for diagnosis. It's only when we're in doubt we do the genetic testing. Now, the, the question that, 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 that I, I guess asked, which is a fair question is, should, should we, you know, in asymptomatic patients, should we do an ultrasound? You know, if you have a kid or if you have a 15-year-old or 20-year-old, should they get tested? Uh, and the, the answer is they should be get tested because they should know if they have, right? Because it's a multi-system disease. Uh, there are other organs besides the kidney that can get affected. You can have aneurysms, you can have liver. But there also there are some potential studies they can be on, right? Uh, so the more active, and if you think about that, it's, it's better to catch, catch them earlier than later, right? If they, if they do have, have PKD. Uh, so the, the, the short answer is I would recommend them to get tested, but I know it's, it's more complex, you know, and that's where genetic counseling comes in as well, you know, they, they are partners in, in this, uh, to talk with them, you know, about the family, about the psychological impact that the diagnosis might have, I think those are. But from a medicine point of view, 
I think it is the right thing to do to, to know and plan accordingly, rather than not think about that and it manifests. As you saw from that, that plot, the kidney function stays stable till it drops, right? And you want to avoid that cliff, you know, when it happens. So, so being proactive is, is definitely uh, the way to go. Now, some basic tests. So be, being your own advocate, uh, what, what things should you focus on when you go and see your nephrologist? So the, the one that probably, if you have come to my previous talks, is creatinine and, and EGFR. So, so the, the test that we do, the, the simple test, the widely used test, the other tests too, to assess kidney function is a simple blood test called creatinine. And, uh, and what we calculate from the creatinine is called EGFR. So EGFR, E stands for estimated, and G stands for glomerulus, F stands for filtration, and R states for rate. But anyways, the term you should know is EGFR, and all of you should know what your EGFR is. How many don't know their EGFRs? You, you know or you don't? You don't, okay. So, but you had a blood test up recently, or creatinine, or you did? Okay. Yeah. A year ago, okay. So now all the labs should automatically report EGFRs. If you just scroll down, because that's actually now almost every lab does it. You know, five years ago that wasn't the case. But but EGFR is a much more sensitive marker than creatinine. So now once again, don't get too you know if, if it's on the lower side, uh, there are a lot of explanations for that as well. But but it's just something. And when we enroll patients in the studies, we actually go by GFR rather than by creatinine. And I'll be going over the studies that, 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 that we're doing currently. So everybody should be, besides looking at your sodium, besides looking at your potassium and all that stuff. The other thing that you should know about is protein in your urine. Uh, so protein is a marker of kidney disease. It's a marker of a lot of other things as well. But, but it's something that, that you should know how much protein you're spilling in your urine. That's done uh, on a pretty standard basis when, when uh, we do uh, any kidney uh, evaluation. That's, uh, it's a urine test uh, that we do. You should have, at least on an annual basis, uh, you know, and if your kidney is stable, then, then we can do it less frequently, but at least on an annual basis, an ultrasound uh, to assess for your kidney size and, and, and also your liver cyst and if there's any of the cysts. Uh, so you look at both the size of the kidneys and also you look at the cysts, you know, how many cysts you have in the, in the kidneys. Question of yeah. why you would do that on an annual basis, I can understand from a study perspective, yeah. but from a patient perspective, right. what so, would you do if they are getting bigger and you're expecting that? Right. So the so question is that why would you so first of all, what I mentioned, Tish, was that if it's growing rapidly, you know, if the kidneys are stable in size, right, for a couple of years, two or three years, then you don't have to do it annually. You know, first of all, we know very little how, how these kidneys, there's a big studies going on just for, for doing CD scans or not CD scans, MRIs and ultrasounds, looking at the kidney size, kidney cyst. But a lot of times, if it's going rapidly, um, if there's any intervention you can do. Now, we have, you know, studies going on. Some people would want to know that, you know, if it's going rapidly, you, your kidney function by a blood test is normal, right? But, but you're approaching that cliff now. If you remember that cyst size, remember the kidney size I showed? So you, you know, approaching a cliff. That will give you some idea that, you know, what's going to happen in the next five or 10 years. People want to do planning, you know. A lot of people come to my clinic and they said, you know, I mean, I want to plan for my job, I want to plan for my family, I want to plan for my traveling, how far I'm from dialysis or transplant, right? So it will give you an idea how rapidly the kidney disease is progressing because the blood test could be misleading, right? So that's the reason why we say, uh, at least if it's progressing, do it on an annual basis. Now there's different, you know, same family, pe people can have the same gene and some people can progress very rapidly and some people can just stay stable. So, so what we recommend is, is doing that. And also if they have any other symptoms, besides that, that might be explained by the enlarging kidneys because, you know, they might have, like I said, gastrointestinal symptoms and they keep on going to a gastroenterologist and they're doing all the scopes and all the other stuff. But, you know, they're not looking at what might actually be the... Yes? The normal number of creatinine. I'm sorry? The normal number. Normal number? Yeah, of the yeah there's a reason why I don't like to give a normal number because, you know, it, it's very misleading. Uh, normal number, if you look at UCLA's lab, is anywhere between 0 0.6 to 1.1, 1 1.2. Yeah, normal one point yeah. two. Right. But, but there is no normal. Oh. Right. So you can have a creatinine 
and still have significance. It's just one tool that we look at. So the point that I'm trying to address, Monique, over here is that creatinine is just one, one test. You look at the overall picture, you know, what's happening. And creatinine is not a very sensitive marker, because creatinine has a lot of other things that can influence it. Muscle mass can, 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 does influence creatinine. Somebody who's very muscular can have a much higher creatinine than somebody who's probably 70 pounds in weight, you know? And all those things are things that we take into account. So lab is only one thing, you know, uh, that we look at. But I'm glad you brought it up, but there's a reason why I, I didn't put in creatinine. Yeah, GFR there is. You know, normal GFR, people say 90 or above is, is what you look for, but even 60 or above should be fine. But it's the trends that are more important. If your GFR was 80, uh, say about two years ago, and now it's 50 on a consistent basis, that's more important than somebody's GFR who was always 50 and didn't drop below that, right? The trends are important. And that's why, Tisha, does that answer your question, though, about the ultrasound? I was asking her. Is, no, no, her question. Tish, your question about the ultrasound. Why do you do them on a frequent yeah, basis? Yeah. Okay, very good. So um, now going to the management. Um, so first of all, the key thing, find a nephrologist who knows about it. And, and this might sound counterintuitive, but it's very important. You know, it's a systemic disease, number one. Number two is there's a lot of, you know, and this is, once again, that's why feedback is important. You know those forms? I really want you to fill out because I think we take your feedback very, very seriously, you know. And one of the feedbacks that I was being given is a lot of times that they're going to, to the nephrologist and they're not getting the right answers, right? So it's very important to find a person who's actually, you know, understands, you know, PKD and it's not just any other disease that, you know, can take a life of its own. So finding and a team approach is very important. Because like I said, it's, it, it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary approach as you can see all, already from all that I've discussed. A dietitian is, how many of you have seen a dietitian over here? Well, you are a dietitian, so that, that doesn't count. <laughs> so so you, if you haven't seen one, you can just see one over here. You know, you're an outstanding dietitian. So, but, but dietitians have a big role, you know, eating right, salt, fat, potassium, all these things go, go towards, you know, uh, a healthier person. So dietitians are very important. Know your tests and medications. You should have a medication list with you. And I've always said that, but also when you're medication list, you should have the dose and you should have the time that you take the medication. So, so timing is also very important. You know, you take in the morning, you take in the afternoon, you take in the evening. So know them, know, have a copy of your test and, and ask questions to your nephrologist um, or your physician, what those numbers really mean, what are, are they, like, you know, are you on the right medications for blood pressure control? You know, not all blood pressure medications are the same. Some are better than others, and you want to be on the best medications you can be. Control your BP, very important. Um, the best way to find out your blood pressure control is to do a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. You know, now, it's not expensive test, but it's not covered by a lot of insurances. But you know, uh, ask the physician if they can order one. Uh, and if you do get the 24-hour blood pressure, make sure you write down, you keep a diary, so that you can keep on what activity you're doing, you know, what, what medication you took at what time, so that will also help us check, uh, get your blood pressure under better control. So all these things matter. Suppose you came in right now to get your blood pressure checked, but you took your, your blood pressure medication at 8 a.m., like a lot of people do, right? So your, your drug is at its peak. Now the peak effect of the drug is right over there. So your blood pressure is well controlled, but what is it at four o'clock? What is it when you go to bed? What is it when, it when you actually wake up in the morning and haven't taken your medication? That's probably a very good indicator what your overall blood pressure is. So I think blood pressure uh, control is an art. You know, it's, it's, it's easily done, but, but, but uh, could, could be uh, improperly done as well. Uh, drink plenty of fluid. You know, there, there is some data that drinking, and, and what does fluid mean? This is actually water, you know, not anything added to it. Uh, just pure water. So two, two and a half liters of fluid intake is what I recommend for patients with PKD. But that should be, and, and a good number is two and a half liters a day, you know, and that should be throughout the day, you know, not just in the morning and in the evening. And it does a lot of things, but one is that if you have any chance of a stone formation, it will act like a flush. You know, the, the, the single biggest thing you can do to prevent uh, kidney stone formation is drinking plenty of fluid, you know, drink to two, two and a half liters. Um, now, don't go crazy on that, don't go 10 liters, you know, because there could be side effects from that as well. 
but two to three liters of fluid intake is not going to cause any problems. It's very, and there's also some, some evidence that it might actually slow down the cyst growth. You know, uh, so there is, is some, some data for that. Um, reduce salt intake. When we say salt, it's sodium chloride that we're talking about. Because there's another salt called potassium chloride. That's your, your salt substitute. When you go to Ralph's and all these stores, you talk about salt substitute. Now, potassium is actually good for blood pressure control, provided your kidneys are functioning normally. You know, uh, that means your GFR is, is okay. If your GFR is not okay, then don't take potassium unless you talk to your physician. Because kidney patients tend to retain potassium, and that's one of the biggest problems. But, but if you have, have a normal GFR, filtration rate of your kidneys, then a, a diet in high potassium and low sodium is actually beneficial for blood pressure control. So, so definitely do that. Um, high protein diet. So this is a question that I get asked a lot about protein. What should my protein intake be? So a high protein diet has been shown to be harmful to the kidneys. Uh, that is well known, you know, and we don't want patients to be in a high protein diet. But that doesn't mean you have to be in a low protein diet, right? You shouldn't go to the other extreme that you avoid protein completely. So you should be on, on a modest intake or, or the right amount of protein. And what's the right amount of protein? The, by rule of thumb, what I give them is if your weight in kilograms is 70, then, then have 70 grams of protein. So one gram per kilogram body weight uh, of protein you should take. Because one of the biggest predictors of kidney uh, outcomes in kidney patients is their protein levels. If it's too low, then, then you can actually have worse outcomes. So, so it's one gram per kilogram body weight. One gram per? Per ki kilogram. Okay. So if you weigh 50 gram, uh, kilograms, you can take 50 grams of protein, plus minus you know, uh, 10, 15, above, below, more, more above, but good quality protein. Okay, so one gram per one kilogram weight, body weight? Yes, yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. One gram per kilogram body weight. Okay. Uh, so so that, that will give you at least a rough estimate uh, of how much protein you should take. Unless yes, you weigh 400 pounds, then you don't want to eat. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So. Could you expand about the quality of the protein? Right, so the quality of protein so it should be high quality protein. And the best quality protein is albumin. You know, that's what we compare with. Uh, and egg white. So if you look at egg white, that's the. Now, my next point was going to be about a vegetarian diet, and I think that's where you're trying to get at. Surat, is that, is that what you're trying to? Yes. Surat, okay. Yeah, so protein, you know, animal protein is, is actually, so they're essential amino acids. So protein is made of amino acids, and they're essential amino acids which are better provided, or at least more comprehensively provided by an animal source of protein than a vegetarian. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence coming out that a vegetarian diet is better for your, your kidneys overall. Uh, so if you have a balanced diet, you know, you can, your vegetarian protein could be as good as animal protein. So and it's, it's a combination, yeah, yeah. You can, you know, you can have a purely vegetarian diet as well, but you know, you have to be balanced, you know, and that's why you should see a dietitian, you know, they probably will be able to give you before embarking on a purely vegetarian diet. But there's, there's a lot of evidence coming about acid buildup in your body, you know, about all that stuff that uh, a vegetarian-based diet is, is better for your kidneys than an animal-based diet. And that's what we recommend. Now, you don't have to go completely a uh, vegetarian diet, but, but definitely start increasing the proportion that's coming from, from, from vegetable sources as opposed to animal sources. So vegetarian maybe because it's vegetable. Yeah, that's what you can talk to a dietitian, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't cook and I don't, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I'm the last person to ask about, about all these sources to balance it. Because diet is, is very, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit complex, you know? And you know, it's supposed, but it's it's uh, there's there's a lot of stuff that a dietitian can help you. You know, uh, about balancing the diet. You know, making sure right proportions. You know, especially if you're eating just uh, um, vegetarian diet. Yep. So, uh, potassium. But just within the sources, there could be different. Uh, potassium is a very important source. But obviously, if you have kidney disease, you want to limit potassium intake because of kidney. But but so I think that's a good point that you brought up. It has to be a balanced diet. You know, um, and that's why. I mean, what I try to do is I give, you know, I don't like extremes uh, in any case. Uh, uh, extremes are never good. But um, protein, you know, a lot of my patients show up and they're told that protein is bad for them and they end up on the dialysis completely malnourished, you know. Um, and then I asked them, I said I was told to take a low protein diet. And I said if you don't define what the low protein diet, you're actually misleading them, right? 
because they don't know. So protein is important, but in the right quantity. Great point. Uh, caffeine, and I'll, I'll come back to that, what caffeine can do. You know, the consensus at this point is to, to limit, limit the caffeine intake because it works through a, a, a messenger called cyclic AMP, which I'll be going over, which is actually affected by caffeine as well. So, so the consensus is that try to cut back on caffeine as, as much as you can. So the treatment uh, we went over, I'm gonna skip this portion. Now, some treatments. So, um, and this is where, where the trial portion comes in. So at this point, there is no FDA-approved treatment for PKD, there isn't any. And there are a lot of trials going on, there's a whole list of trials, uh, but I'll be focusing on two big studies that we're doing at UCLA, uh, as far as drugs are concerned. Uh, so now this is a very complicated uh, diagram. Yeah, it's very complicated. So, but the the point that, that I want to bring up from this this uh, cartoon is that what's going on in PKD. This is just one one cell of the cyst. So, what's going on in in your um, in your kidneys is very complex, and there are multiple sites. And I think uh, you were asking about metformin. It's right on the left hand side. So, so there is so there are multiple ways of of actually regulating the uh, cyst growth. And anything can go wrong in this whole pathway, and that can lead your cyst to grow. So cyst growth is almost very close to like cancer. So it's it's like uncontrolled growth. Cells are dividing, you know, uh, un uncontrolled, and that's why these these cysts getting like any bigger. It's not cancer per se, but but if you want to give an analysis, and that's why a lot of drugs that are used for cancer are being tested for this as well. So it's uncontrolled proliferation of your kidney cells that's leading to this kidney enlargement and stuff. And I just wanted to point this out over here because it is a bit complex. And there, there are two pathways that we are going to be looking at. So one is uh, right over here, the V2 receptor. This is tolvaptin. That's where to tolvaptin, one of the studies that we're doing, is working on that. It works at that receptor, and it actually works on cyclic AMP uh, eventually, which is thought to be involved in cell proliferation, which is right over here. So that's, that's this pathway. Um, and then the mTOR inhibitors were used. That's the tolvaptin study. And the other one that we are doing is the EGF. So right at the top over here, uh, let me see if can do it. So if you see this over here, these, these are the growth factors. The GF stands for growth factors. So once again, cell proliferation, right? Uncontrolled. So we have EGF, we have insulin-like growth factor, which is IGF. We have uh, VEGF, which is vascular growth factor. So my, the other study that we're doing, the CADMON, is we're, we're looking at this. And once again, we're affecting this pathway. And, then the, and this is the other pathway they're looking at. And there have been studies on the mTOR inhibitors. I think what Sarith was mentioning is with metformin, um, somewhere over here. Metformin, which is a commonly used drug, um, Actually, uh, here. That's so. It's it's a very commonly used drug for for diabetes, but it has some shown some. So the the rest of the talk will be on V two receptor. And the the EGF receptor. These these are the two big studies we're doing. And this is the the other way to look at it. So if you look at the top, you have the polycystic kidney disease. Uh, cyclic AMP is, is one of the messengers. Um, and we have the EGF uh, receptor over here, and uh, block, by blocking this, we can actually block the cell growth and pro proliferation. And that's and this is an article that just came out uh, in JSTAN. So JSTAN, which stands for Journal of American Society of Nephrology, is one of our main journals in kidneys. That's the uh, um, what what we use. So so let let me start with the with the. CADMON study. So that's the, the one of the big studies that we're doing at, at UCLA. The phase one just ended. So the phase one study, so there are three phases of, of any drug coming to the market. Phase one is, is about the dose, about the safety. Um, and we just, and I know there, there are a couple of people, actually more than a couple of people who are on, on this, the phase one study and now on the phase two. This is probably one of the more exciting studies that we're doing. Uh, uh, it works on the EGF receptor, and UCLA was the major site uh, for the study, and then we just started the phase two. So, and, and the, 
and, and the role of the phase two is to look at the effect of the drug, which doesn't have a name right now. It's called KD019 on eGFR. So once again, the keyword is GFR. That's, that is the, looking at the functional status of your kidney. So you should all know what your GFR is. Uh, so that's the, the phase two study that we just, just uh, started. Now, uh, the, the drug uh, or the molecule is, which is called KD019, it's a small molecule. It's metabolized through the liver to CYP3A4. It's highly protein bound. But the numbers that we are seeing over here is the IC50 values. Uh, and it's, it's a very uh, effective molecule in inhibiting the enzyme, the tyrosine kinase, which actually leads to cell proliferation. So I think that's, that's what I'm trying to get with, with this slide. Uh, now, this is an interesting study, and this is, once again, confidential data. So the, please don't repeat it. Uh, it's okay for, for this talk, but uh, it it's, will be published soon. Now, starting from, uh, this, is, this is a mouse model. Starting from in your, the right-hand side, that's the, what, how the kidney should look like uh, in, in, um, in, in this model. Now, they, they do some knockouts of genes, and then we look at the, see how big the, the kidney is now after the, you know, they actually created a model for PKD. And then they put them on the dose of KD019, um, 0, 7.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and then they did that um, 15 milligrams, and just see the kidney size. It was actually a decrease in kidney size. And this is uh, day 21, uh, postnatal. So very exciting results in animal data, right? Uh, so, so that got us very excited. Uh, and I, you know, we have been corresponding for, from with them for quite some time, but this is, this is at least for, for my, uh, own was, and this also was, was uh, translated to the kidney function as well. And this is a rat model. So that's the untreated uh, uh, with polycystic kidney disease. That's 7.5 milligrams per kilogram, and then that's the 15 milligrams. This is for ARPKD. So, so th th that got us going, you know, that got us starting. That, that's, that's very exciting. So, but now we also wanted to look at how, how safe the, the drug is and how effective it is. So just a few things to get enrolled in the study. Uh, I have my, all my research staff over here. Please make sure the slots are limited. You know, this, the other one, Tolvaptin, is a much bigger study, 1,300 patients or close to it. This is only 35 slots nationwide. So there's, there's, there's very limited slots for this, this study. And to be on this study, uh, you all obviously have to have a diagnosis of ADPKD. Uh, age is 18 to 55. Actually, that is, I, I just have to double check that. Um, is it 18, 55 or below 50? Or maybe they increased it to 55 for this study because for the other phase it was less than 50. But anyways, in that range, the GFR has to be above 50. So once again, they're going after patients who actually have decent kidney function. You know, because once it starts declining, once you hit that slope, right, you know, it becomes uh, uh, a bit late, you know, in the game. And then, like I said, it has limited slots. Now, we, we, did, we did the phase one study. We were the major site nationwide. So, and we had, we had quite a bit of patience. And, and I thank all of the people who are in this room, but there are a few. And if they want to discuss their study with, with the other people, they can share that. But obviously, for HIPAA purposes, I can't give the names out. Um, but, but we're very thankful, because if they didn't participate in the phase one, we would never get to the phase two. Uh, the phase one was more uh, a dose finding study. What's the right dose? We, we tested three doses. 50, 100, 150, was also looking at adverse events. Uh, so let me talk about some of the adverse events that are known. Now this drug, which is also being tested for lung cancer at a much higher dose, you know, and they're much more advanced in the studies. But once again, the connection between uncontrolled cell proliferation and, and uh, cancer and PKD. So something uh, to keep in the back of your mind. So this one, we're using a much lower dose, uh, but the three most common reported adverse events, one was, was uh, a skin rash, you know, uh, because this receptor, and, it, and it's not a, a drug allergy. It's not that you're allergic to the drug. It's just the way the drug works, it can cause an acne form rash. And uh, we, we saw that, especially the higher 150 milligram doses, we saw more. Some patients did just fine. Some people had a rash and they had to go off the study. Some people had a very small acne form rash, but was a pimple on the face and it bothered them. So they had to go off the, that's a personal choice, you know. I would rather keep my kidneys, uh, but, but it's a personal choice that was important to them, and, and that's fine. Um, now, so that was number one. Uh, it, 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 there's a rash. The other one that we didn't see, at least, and we had a good number of patients, is diarrhea. It can cause a bit of diarrhea. Now, 
my, my take on at least PKD patient is it's better to have diarrhea than constipation. You know, a lot of PKD patients tend to be constipated. So I don't think, it, but anyways, I didn't, we did not see any diarrhea in, in our. And then there was the third one was some EKG changes that you can see. And uh, obviously we have the dose adjust for that and that took care of that. Now if it was higher, then we would take them off the study. But those were the three. So safety wise, I think uh, we have done very well. And once again, I don't want to thank everybody in this room who participated because if they didn't participate in phase one, we would never get to phase two studies. So um, we are extremely grateful to, to all of them who participated in that study. Uh, now, if you're interested in the study, please let me know. It's time sensitive. It's not in my hands, you know. Um, if any to email us or call us and let us know if you have family members who are interested and fall in this age group, you know. If you don't know your EGFR, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll look, look it up. You send us our labs. But once again, it's, it's, a, it's a very limited slot that we have. Um, and I don't want to miss out on if people are interested. So uh, Dwight, just make sure that the Inland uh, Empire, you know, the big PKD new chapter, knows about this as well. I mean, Dwight has been extremely supportive and very informative. So I mean, so get to know Dwight as well because you know he, he does send a lot of very useful information, and not just about studies, but about a lot of other things as well. And and Dwight was actually in the KDGO. I saw your name, so that was excellent. The KDGO uh, guidelines that just came out, um, and they're published now, right? They're published. So KDGO is. Kidney disease improving global outcomes is it's a global um, group that actually comes up with guidelines and they had a big, I, I think somewhere in uh, Edinburgh or um, yeah, and Scotland and uh, they came up with some of the experts got together and they came up what they think is a consensus. Yes, Tish. In the papers that you handed out yeah. here on this study, yeah. it talks about the fact that there are frequent echocardiograms during the study. Why is that? So they, they want to be safe, that everything in the heart is okay. That's one thing that we do on, on a regular basis. So most of the studies are, are doing that now. EKGs, 24-hour blood pressure monitors. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, with this study, this is phase two. Yes, right? yes. And you said phase one, UCLA was the, and so it's the major. Right. So is UCLA still the major, um, I guess, source or? Yeah, yeah, or, it is, yeah. And so when you say limited spots, yeah. Uh, uh, I think there are 35 slots nationwide, and it's competitive. Nationwide. Yes, yes. So and it's, locally, you, you no, no. They, they, there's no sl uh, slots assigned to any center. It's first come, first basis. And you know how many are open right now? Um, okay. I can find out. It's still open, but but I'll find out because so the slots are nationwide. So they they're, they're I think I mean and don't quote, but the, the very few centers nationwide, six or seven. It's, it's not. Not too many centers are, are were approached for this. UCLA was approached because of our PKD program and center, but they're going after the bigger centers. Uh, and it's competitive. So if I enroll all the patients in the 35, you know, uh, I mean, I think they'll have a problem with that, but, but, but they, 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 you know, it's competitive. So one center can have as many, but it's first come, first basis. Okay. Yeah. Like absolutely, ab part. absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is, I'm a bit concerned because a lot of patients have contacted me and they were a bit late last time. They were, yeah. they were a bit upset, you know, and we tried to accommodate in the phase two studies, you know, right. where the phase one was stopped. And the phase three will be a much bigger study, you know, oh. but I don't know when that will start. Okay. And it, as you can see, you know, if you want one. And also, there is no placebo here, as oh. far as I know. I'll, 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 I'll double check on that. Okay. But in this phase two, there is no. In phase three, there will be a placebo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Phase two, there will be a placebo? No, no, phase three. You know, phase three. phase three will be much bigger. You know, phase three is always much bigger studies, you know. Okay. So, but, but I'll double check as far as I know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that. But they're looking at the effect of EGFR. Okay. Yes. If I must have been, you should have said that um, you're just there with all sides. Yeah. Everything, everything. And also reducing the production of mucus. Right. So, so when, when it's kidney size, and you know, once again, this is preliminary data that we have, you know, and once again, this is not my data. Uh, but but the understanding was that, uh, and they'll, they'll get published soon, so I'll, I'll collect more. But but we're seeing both in both models. That was a key thing, the rat and, and the, myself. So your question is about cyst size uh, and new cyst. So yes. my assumption would be that that there would be less of new cyst, and the existing cysts are, are smaller. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now once again, this is this is animal data, you know, but it's, it's very exciting as you can see, you know, and that's why we got very heavily involved yeah, with this great. with this study. Now the, so that's our, our one study, CADMON study. So, so please fill out your information. 
um, it's, it's very important for us, you know, and contact us. You know, you have my direct email address, direct line to my office, my research office, um, and there's enough, I think, we distribute the cards. The other one is probably, you have heard about a lot, it's called the Paul Vapton study. This is a V2 receptor antagonist. So this blocks the V2 receptor that I showed, and, and it works through cyclic AMP pathway. It's a double blind study, so there is, is placebo control over here, uh, and compares the efficacy of patients with, with in subjects with PKD. Now, the drug has been on market for quite some time. There's, there's, there's a pretty long, uh, at least safety, you know, it's, it's available for hyponatremia when your sodium runs low. So it's been around for six, seven years. It's, it's been heavily studied, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three. This is actually an extension. They did go for FDA approval, uh, uh, and, and I was involved in that as well, uh, but um, it wasn't, they, they wanted more data. FDA, and one of the concerns was liver disease. They did see in a small number of patients some liver. We uh, did not see the same kind of, you know, liver issues, but there was a small number of patients. Most of them actually recovered, but some of them didn't, so you have to be a bit cautious. Uh, but I think we also are very, very uh, detail-oriented, so I think we look at patients and give them advice about other things as well. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, definitely a very good study to be on. Uh, and this is your time because, uh, but as you can see, uh, number of patients, and I think that's close to what I, what I know, um, there are much more sites for this study. It's a phase three, actually, a later phase three, so it's a much bigger study uh, to be done. But there is a placebo uh, control over there. Um, it's a 12-month study. Uh, this study hasn't opened yet, but, but you should be in contact with me because we can at least start getting you ready and on our list. As soon as the study opens, because it has to go through a lot of regulatory work before the study gets approved by UCLA. So we're in the process, and hopefully within six to eight weeks, we should have all the approval process. And um, yeah, so, but, but just let, let me know if, if anyone or any of you know would be interested in the study. Uh, the study objective is to compare. So what's interesting is that the, the earlier studies were looking at kidney size uh, as a marker of uh, kidney function. And uh, I think um, FDA did not want to buy that. They, they didn't want to look at kidney size as a surrogate marker for kidney function. So one of the demands probably were to look at EGFR. So once again, going to EGFR versus kidney size, right? Kidney volume. So they wanted, so here it's looking at tolvaptin treatment to reduce EGFR, uh, change in uh, EGFR from pre-treatment to post-treatment follow-up. So the second objective is to compare the overall um, safety and especially hepatic safety, or which hepatic stands for liver, the liver safety uh, of, of uh, tolvaptin um, with the placebo. So once again, it is a placebo control study. And to compare the incidence of PKD complications during the trial. So my, my take would be to advise to all of you, if you do qualify for the study, be on it. It's, it's definitely uh, a well-studied drug. Um, it has shown at least uh, benefit in, in the data that we have. Um, and if you don't get on the study, uh, you might not be able to get the drug for at least another year till the drug gets approved. It was a 12-month study. And then they won't go back to FDA and get for the approval. So please let me know. Uh, they did make some changes uh, in the criteria. Once again, the basic things are basic. You have to have a diagnosis of ADPKD. Uh, but the age group they, they increased uh, now it's up to 65 years of age, uh, you can be on the study. Uh, but the GFRs are a bit different. So if you are between 18 to 55, then they want the eGFR between 25 and 65. But if you're 56 or 65, they want a bit more advanced, which makes sense because as you get older, your, you know, with PKD, your, your disease, your, your GFR drops. Once again, if you remember that, that drop that we saw. So this is the age group. You know, once again, please, please contact me if there's any interest on being on this study. And then with that, I'm gonna end my talk because I, I know people want to mingle, but this is once again my contact information. Please don't forget to leave your contact information that we can contact you. And if, if any help I can be or my, my staff can be, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. <laughs> so any questions? Yes.
I can send it to you, David. Okay, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll send that. Okay. So that's a signaling pathway. I'll, I'll send that. Yeah, yeah, no, that was really fascinating. Oh, yeah. Yes. With the advancement of medical procedures, why don't we just, why don't we just drain the liquid from the kidney? Okay, so, so that's a very good point, and there is an answer for that. So the question is, why don't we just puncture those cysts and drain them, right? So um, it will be a short-term treatment at the best of the cyst. But the second thing, every time you injure a cyst, right, puncture it, they might, it might set up a pathway of inflammation that it might cause fibrosis. So we actually do not recommend, you know, unless, and even when the kidneys are fairly enlarged, we don't. And that's why sometimes a lot of people don't want contact sports, like because if you keep on punching the kidney, those cysts can birth. So cyst puncture is definitely not, unless there is a, a reason that they, the cysts are infected or something, it's not the treatment for, for PKD. Yeah, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a very simplistic approach that, you know, just keep on puncturing them. But if you look at the pathology, and that's why I was focusing on cell proliferation, right? The whole pathways that I was showing you. So fluid accumulation is just one part of it. The other thing is what is making these cells grow, uncontrolled growth. And that's where I think we need to focus on. But, but that's a very good point. I and mean, that's a question that I get asked a lot. Yeah, very good, yes. Okay, so um, the question is uh, how to differentiate between uh, type one and type two. And there is, you know, the, the gene that's causing it is on different chromosomes, uh, on four as opposed to 16. Uh, that's the only way. Otherwise, the manifestations are very similar. So, so PKD2 just behaves as PKD1, just milder and a bit later. But, but is there testing for that? Yes, that gene testing, yes. Yes, there is testing, yeah. You can get it tested. Did you say you did that gene test as part of the study? No, not as part of the study, no, no, no. So, so it, it's, but it's, it's available, yeah. Yes, sir. Regarding the proboxone, which is a new variable, which is sometimes as well Yeah, yeah. If it's monitored, is, could you see that something is happening in the report, is it possible? Yeah, so very good point. So that's a, thanks for bringing this up, Sarit, because you know the, the issue with, with liver and tolvactin? So, right, right. So, so we do monitor you extremely closely. You know, it's almost every month that we do testing. And don't quote me on this, because there's a protocol for this, but we monitor you. So, so yes, so if there's any chance it's going up, we can take you off or dose suspend you, you know, and also give you advice what other things can affect livers, because you can be affected by other things as well, not necessarily by the drug. Right. It doesn't have to be the right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the extreme rare cases, and this is not just about twelve, I mean, there could be this acute liver failure. I mean, that happens, you know, and we know that. I mean, it can happen with any drug, for that matter. You know, some more than the others. Um, so yeah. But in other ones, you know, we monitor them. So it's, a, it's you know, if there is if there's any safety signal, what, what we call, for liver disease or, or liver impairment, uh, we will we will. And that's why when I said, you know, there's, there's so many eyes looking at it, it's not just one pair of eyes, it's not just my eyes looking at it. There's a whole data monitoring board that looks at it very closely. And they will be looking at, at the liver very, very carefully. Because, you know, if you think from their perspective, they really want that on, on their records if there's any liver problems. So you're absolutely right. Thanks for bringing that up. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, we're looking at, so uh, we're looking at, at that. You know, the rash was, was uh, probably about 40 or 50%, but you know, I'll have to get back with the different doses, you know, and unfortunately my memory is, is not as good as I thought it was, but um, uh, we'll get back to that. And also I can give you with the whole, because we'll be publishing this study very, uh, very soon. Yeah, yeah, yep. Right. No, no, no. Uh, and that's why, you know, your email is very important to us. If you want it, first of all, if the study is published, definitely the people who are on the study, uh, and I'm the first author, so, so we will be publishing it. We're looking for the journal right now. Uh, but I will make sure that at least everybody who's on the study will get a copy of it. Um, but if anybody's interested, you know, we, we will, there's some copyrights on, on the journals. We just want to make sure that it's okay with them. But, but we will be uh, going over that. Absolutely. Thanks for bringing that. Yes. Really quick, for the, yeah. the 
say, yeah. did you say because first line they did get rid of people with volume, but they're not doing that this No, time. no, no. But but they are doing the Im imaging studies, you know. And you know, I think when I was looking at uh, one of my office staff wrote it up, but they were looking about the phase one, phase two, phase three, tolvaptin. So that's the, the so the two tolvaptin studies. One is for tolvaptin naive patients. That means that they've never been on tolvaptin before. And the other one is actually will be people who are already on the study, they will just get an extension. So there are two studies. So just, just so the people know about that. No, I, no, 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 no. As, as far as I know, it, it shouldn't be the volume. So it, it's not in the criteria. Yeah. Yep. And also my office staff is very, you know, if you want to set up appointments and meetings with us, you know, just, just let us know and we can go in the protocol. The protocol is, you know, I think it's getting very close to being finalized. Uh, I, th I think it is finalized right now. And yeah. And as one of these, the two that you were talking about was the Yes, 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 yeah. Actually, I was talking about the CAD model study first. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was, and I think that's, a, I, I will go with that. Okay, you know. perfect. Yeah. Very good. I think, yes. Does, um, Yeah. Um, does estrogen, in terms of women, in sort of increase either in kidney cysts or in the liver cysts? Liver. It seems to be just liver, not liver. Liver. Liver is, is known. Yes, because you know that that's another good point. So so the the tolvaptin drug does not affect liver. There is no V2 receptors on the liver cells. Okay. Uh, estrogen receptors are there. IGF and the other growth receptors are there, uh -huh. um, and we'll be looking at at. Uh, the, the CADMON study, EGF, if it has any effects. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good point. And also, what I would like to do is all of you guys should mingle too. You know, there's a lot of, you know, networking that you guys have sharing what you have been through. I know, Sarit, you have done that in the past, like, you know, sharing, you know. So, this is the other time that I want to give people to. Yeah. Yeah. Which the body doesn't digest. Right. They interfere with the E. coli uh, adherence to the right. diet. Yeah. And since I've been taking it, I reduced the EO infection once in the month. But obviously that's off label, so I, I no, can't. I yeah, know, yeah, I yeah. But it's I don't want my license to be pulled. But, um, but yeah, so, but, but, that, but yeah. Yeah, so please talk to Sarita about that. Very good. So, anything else? My office, my staff, anybody? Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah.